Uh, our topic today, we're going to be looking at uh, unity in the church. In particular, in Proverbs 6, there's this little section where the, the author of Proverbs says, here are six things that God hates. And I'm thinking, man, if there is a scripture that says, here's th- six things that God hates, I want to know what those six things are. And then the author goes, actually, you know what? There's actually seven. So he starts off, there are six things God hates. Actually, wait a second, seven. That's literally, that's what it says in, in uh, Scripture. It says, the Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. And today, we're looking at the afterthought, the seventh, the one that the author started writing down and was like, I missed one. Seven. There are seven. Let me read them for you, and then we'll, we'll get to, uh, probably to understanding why this is going to be a, <clears throat> I mean, hopefully not too heavy a, a topic tonight, um, but hopefully a for some of us, and maybe even for us as a community, maybe a like a turning point or a pivot point for us, uh, where something perhaps we have individually avoided in the past will start to embrace. Maybe something collectively we've avoided will start to move towards. Here are the six things, and we'll get to the seventh. Six things, detestable to God, which means we need to take them seriously. What are these six things? Arrogant eyes. God does not like arrogant arrogance. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that plots wicked schemes. Feet eager to run to evil. A lying witness who gives false testimony. And you hear some of those things and you're like, yeah, of course. God doesn't like liars or arrogance or, or pride. Doesn't like shedding innocent blood or injustice. People who plot wicked things or run to evil who love doing what is evil. Of course, God doesn't love those things. What about the seventh? What about this bonus feature? And what else does God find detestable? The one who stirs up trouble among brothers. In Titus, Paul, who is by now an older bloke, writing to a young leader of many churches... This is what he writes to Titus. He says, As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. These are very strong words from Paul, very strong words from the author of those Proverbs concerning divisive Christians. And we, like you and I, we we need to heed every word of Scripture. And in particular tonight, as we focus in on these words, we would be wise to hear them and walk carefully. It's easy to unintentionally sow discord. It's not something that you need to purposefully, maliciously set out. Like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a rift between these two people. (laughs) I'm going to go do it. Uh, We can do this carelessly. We can do this uh, through spreading rumors or half-truths, or we want to get, get back at someone, or, uh, or ha- like claim vengeance for ourselves. We do this when we have a preference, even if it's, not a, if, if it's not a matter of sin, like my way's good and your way's evil, but both ways seem good, but this is my preference, and I want my preference, and so I'm going to make it so that you guys, who are making me uncomfortable, or, or do things that I don't want to do, uh, either get shunned or minimized, or you don't have a voice in this. It's very, very easy for us to do this, intentionally and unintentionally do it. So Spirit, help us as we listen to that. Let's let's pray together. Father, we need your help. Always, always need your help. And in particular today, as we are looking at these scriptures in Proverbs and many other places in your word where uh, you help us understand what is discord, why it's such a a life-taking thing and why you don't like it we need your help help us to not just grow in understanding today although certainly we want to gain your mind uh, but we also want to uh, gain your love for others help us as we are learning to become more and more like Jesus in whose name we ask amen so what is discord uh, <clears throat> perhaps if you think about it as the opposite to accord or, or harmony, when you hear someone singing, a good singer, 
hear someone singing, and then someone throws in a harmony. Man, it sounds beautiful. And then there's, a, there's maybe a third note, like different notes, but they're complementary notes. And they make a chord, and it sounds beautiful. And you think, wow, it sounds lovely, and it's attractive. Discord is the opposite of that. It's where there's two notes that are not in harmony with one another, either intentionally singing off-key or not being able to hit a note, and it is actually repelling, and it's disturbing. This is what the writer of Proverbs and what Paul is trying to say here, and as we'll see, many authors of Scripture, even Jesus himself, talk about that we have been, uh, us, even in this room, let alone we, the church, we have been united with one another in our union with Christ. Therefore, we need to pursue unity with one another. It's actually something that we talk about at City Light I mean, pretty regularly, at least every couple of months, because Scripture talks about it regularly. And because we want to be in Scripture a lot, <laughs> we actually uh, we see this coming up over and over and over again. Here's part of the problem. <clears throat> part of the problem is, if we kind of go outside the church and look at our wider culture in Australia in 2022, uh, we do not do conflict well. In fact, even inside the church, we don't do conflict well. Probably, probably in your friendship circles, you don't do conflict well. Maybe, and I, I pray this isn't true, but maybe in your marriages, you don't do conflict well. Or, you know, in your special, special relationships, uh, you don't do conflict well. Uh, maybe in your neighborhoods, if a current affair is anything to go by. We don't do conflict well. We just don't do conflict well. Part of the problem is that <clears throat> uh, we are both at the same time anti-conflict in our culture. We would prefer to not step into an uncomfortable situation uh, and keep some sort of what we think is peace, but is actually, in actual fact, not peace at all. Um, or what we do is in our culture at least, uh, we demonize people we disagree with so that we don't actually have to disagree with them at all because they're evil, actually. And there's no point in dealing with an evil person. There's no discussion with someone who's evil. And if they disagree with me, they're necessarily evil. Let's have a look at uh, one, again, non, non-Christian commentator. He's a psychologist. Dr. Tan Veer Ahmed says this, the undercurrent of our debates is the growing construction of vulnerability. My field of The psychological sciences must wear some of the blame. The limits are placed on the view that citizens can be psychologically harmed if they experience offense and are no longer able to engage as autonomous, rational citizens. He's saying, if somebody criticizes you or even disagrees with you, all of a sudden, in our culture, we are unable to deal with disagreement. We actually lose agency to disagree. He goes on, this is more pronounced given the cultural decline of organized religion with his conception of man as moral being. He says, psychological man has a personality but not a character. The significance of this is that anybody now experiencing emotional distress can more easily blame it upon the outside world, be it their boss, their biology, or societal structures. This is a critical driver of this age of resentment-based identity politics. He's saying, if you disagree with me, you're now actually my enemy. I don't have a character anymore. I only have a personality. And if you do not agree with me, completely in my personality, then you are actually against me and you're my enemy. And we can't have any rational discussion or debate because you necessarily hate me, even if there's no animosity at all, because we can't disagree. We have no common ground for conflict anymore. And he finishes this, this thought by saying this, those who believe some are not resilient enough to withstand robust discussion contribute to a shrill hypersensitivity in modern debates. All of it's then magnified by social media, which only heightens people's sense of self-righteousness. This growth in subjectivity is couched in the language of caring and compassion, but its goal is social tyranny through greater regulation and intervention. It harms us all for for it paints us as lacking agency, and over time, this is exactly how we start to behave. So it's this downward spiral of, I, we can't disagree, we have no common ground for rationally discussing anything because if you disagree with me, you're my enemy and you hate me, therefore I'm a victim, therefore I have no agency, therefore we, uh, you disagree with me and you're my enemy, therefore I'm more victimized, and down and down and down we go. The problem is there are actual victims of injustice. 
There are actual victims of evil. We've looked at this, I mean, throughout this series, really, even, even just within the church, people who have suffered abuse, people who have even just suffered under neglectful systems and structures. Because if we don't have any common ground or appetite for conflict, then if you disagree with me, you must be my enemy. Another commentator says, this is not a political correctness issue. It's a fundamental rejection of the possibility to consider that the people who don't feel the same way as you might be right. It's a preference to see the other side as a cardboard cutout and not the complicated individual human beings that they actually are. It's going to saying, well, if you're against me, therefore the only thing that matters about you is you disagree with me. And so we, dis- we dehumanize people who disagree with us. Because I, I, I must be right. I, I don't need to change. And therefore, if what you're saying is different to me, even just in a preference, not even if we're talking about anything sinful, just, just a, I prefer this kind of music, or I prefer this version of, our preferred vision of our neighborhood, our country, our world, uh, then you are necessarily my enemy because that's all I need to know about you is you disagree with me. This kind of thinking has seeped into the Aussie church and we are terrible at conflict now. I don't know if we were ever good at conflict, but we are really bad at it now. What tends to happen is we have this veneer of unity and veneer of peace because we avoid conflict we see con- we've borrowed and adopted the, the culture around us, uh, their perspective on conflict. And we say, well, conflict's difficult. Conflict means I might be wrong about something. Uh, you know, uh, that might be offensive to me. It might be difficult for me. Uh, therefore, we just do not have conflict. It's actually made for really poor workplaces as well because bosses uh, are terrified of trying to bring correction. Friends are terrified of trying to bring correction. In fact, they don't even think about bringing correction for a friend who's hurtling towards disaster or destruction, but rather they applaud them along the way, thinking this is what I'm supposed to do because we are so terrible at conflict. So what do we, what do, we do about this? Uh, I'll, I'll put it to you, and if you've been around Cedar Light for a while, you will have heard me say before, uh, Christians should be the best fighters. And by that, I don't mean we should win the most. By that, I mean we should be the best at conflict. We should do conflict very, very well. There is conflict that is unhelpful and divisive and sows discord, and we want to avoid that. That is detestable to God. He hates that kind of conflict. But there's another kind of conflict which is helpful conflict, which is restorative conflict, which actually leads to unity. Because if we have a problem or if there is disunity, us pretending there is no disunity, pretending there is no conflict, is not going to lead to unity. It's going to lead to more conflict, uh, sorry, more division. So actually conflict in the presence of division can lead to unity. Therefore, Christians must become good at conflict. Let me prove my case from Scripture. Uh, James brother of Jesus, he writes this in his letter, chapter 4, says, what causes quarrels, which are those like long-term arguments, and what causes fights, or those like short-term barneys among you, what causes these things? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend on your passions. So saying, man, your problem is your incorrect passions, And if you'd only ask, you receive, but then you don't receive because you ask only to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. That's actually supposed to be a really cutting insult for for the Holy Spirit through James to say to us when we fight for our own personal gain and sow disunity, among the brothers and sisters of Christ, that we are in some sense adulterers. How? He goes on to explain. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? He's not saying don't be friends with people in the world. He's saying don't adopt the world's way of doing things. 
When you do that, you are joining yourself to the world and separating yourself from God's ways. And, and James is saying it's like committing adultery. If we are the bride of Christ and we are, and we abandon our unity with Jesus and join with the world's way of doing things, it's supposed to make us think, this is very serious. It says, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James shows us that as Christians, people who belong to Jesus, people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, we don't engage with conflict in the way that our culture tells us to. We want to be the best fighters. We want to be the best at conflict. It says some conflict is unhelpful, the conflict that comes from conflicting desires. Pretty evident in us humans when, we, when two people who are selfish try to have a relationship with one another, friendship, um, on the sporting field, two people who want the ball and don't want to share or play as a team, two people in a romantic relationship who are selfish, man, that's going to end horribly. And not just end horribly, it's going to be horrible the whole time for two people who are selfish. We, all, we know this already. Most of the churches written to in what is now the New Testament I include parts about conflict because all the churches were having conflict. Because conflict is a part of all of our lives, therefore we've got to get good at conflict. We see conflict on a small scale all around us in our own relationships. Conflict on a grand scale, nation against nation, ideologies clash, uh, extremists and not so extremists fighting. The sinful, unhelpful, divisive kind of conflict starts with selfishness, my way is the way, and incorrect passion. So it's not saying passion is wrong. So when passion is incorrectly applied to things that are not in line with how God would have us live, those are the things that lead to conflict. It's not something external, like like our culture will tell us. Well, you're not sinful. You're actually awesome exactly as you are. You don't need to change for anyone. In fact, everyone needs to change for you. Everyone needs to change. Even reality needs to change for you. When selfishness or incorrect passions manifest, they always lead to quarreling or fighting. They always lead to unhelpful, divisive conflict, necessarily. Because you cannot have unity when you have selfishness. Those two things cannot coexist unless you happen to have perfectly aligned incentives and desires. So everybody wants the same selfish end. But it doesn't last long. It leads to fractured relationships, firstly with one another. So Jesus even said, if we harbor hatred towards our brothers, and we have hatred if we disagree, because in our culture we know, if you disagree with me, you hate me. If you hate me, you're my enemy, and I also hate you. Again, the 2D cardboard cutout of the person. They're not a, they're not a human being. They're, an en- they're my enemy. They don't bear the image of God. All I need to know about them is they disagree with me. This is what culture would say. This will break down a fraction of relationships with one another. Jesus said, if we harbor hatred towards our brothers, we've we've as good as murdered them in our hearts. It's a big deal. At least a fraction of relationship with God. James doesn't pull punches. He says, these people are being adulterous when they live like this. Cheating on God with the world and its ways. And just a few verses later, in verse 6, James writes, and God opposes the proud. Not just committing adultery, but becoming, again, somehow God's enemy in this sense. It says, but he gives grace to the humble. So if that is unhelpful conflict, uh, let me tell you, not all conflict is unhelpful. We've seen this even in the last couple of weeks in our series, where there has been abusive leadership, where there's been uh, a a, um, system in a, even a church community or a family or any kind of social structure that leads to neglect or abuse, those things need to be challenged. They need to be exposed. There needs to be conflict. Conflict can be unhelpful. Conflict can be very helpful. Conflict is just a tool, like a hammer. It can be used to build things up. It can be used to break things down. What is 
helpful conflict. What does it look like? Don Carson, he says, if it's hard to accept a rebuke, even a private one, it's harder still to administer one in loving humility. A rebuke from a sister or a brother, someone who loves you, who sees you acting in a way that might be a blind spot to you, you don't even even see it in your own life, or sees you hurtling towards destruction or distraction or death, and comes to you and says, I've noticed this about you, or I saw this, or I heard you say this, or or, I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I get the feeling that you are going down a destructive path. To hear that is difficult, but to be the bold person compelled by love to go to someone and say to them, I, I think you're headed for destruction. That's even harder. But a loving rebuke is conflict that, when rightly and lovingly and humbly administered, humbly and rightly received, leads to unity and restoration. There's conflict that leads to disunity. There's conflict that leads to unity. When Peter goes off track at Antioch, He starts not hanging out with Gentile believers, only hanging out with Jewish believers, hanging out with people who say, well, you've got to be circumcised to be saved. Paul hears about Peter's error. And Paul, he's a guy who had previously been going from house to house, rounding up Christians, throwing them in jail. Some of them would die. Like like an anti-Christian terrorist rolling around. And here's this guy who's been radically saved by faith. He's the guy who does not have the moral high ground to come in and say, I'm really awesome, you're really terrible, you've got to be better like me. No, no, that's not, that's not the good kind of rebuke we're talking about. He doesn't come standing on his own authority. He comes in saying, Peter, you are not preaching the gospel. He brings a loving, humble rebuke. And Peter humbly receives the rebuke, unity is restored, and the gospel message becomes strong once again. There's an example of good conflict. Paul writes about this in Galatians. He says, I opposed him to his face. Real real friends will to your face, not talk about you behind your back. That's the kind of conflict that sows disunity. Real friends will come and to your face say, you're making a mistake. I love you. I'm not coming in with the moral high ground. I'm not, not coming in saying I'm better than you. I'm coming in as a, fellow sinner and fellow saint to say, please abandon this foolishness. Here's a big idea. We love good conflict that leads to unity. Because of the gospel, uh, we don't need to be offended when we are rebuked or corrected. We don't need to be offended when we are rebuked or corrected because of the gospel. We know that our state before a holy God, apart from Jesus, is sinner under the wrath of God. Our state in Christ, because of the gospel, is saved, loved, like showered with grace and affection, intimacy with the Father and the Son through the Spirit, an eternity with the Father. We don't don't need to take offense when someone comes to us and says, you're a sinner, because that's that's part of the, like a foundational part of the gospel. We know we're a sinner. We We don't come to God and say, look at my awesomeness, God, please accept me. We come to Him with empty hands and say, We have nothing but gratitude and thanks to you, our Father, because of what our big brother Jesus has done on our, on our account. Because of the gospel, we don't take offense at all. How do we do this? Let's have a look. Firstly, we walk towards conflict. Just like Jesus walked towards you, just like Paul walked towards Peter, We need to walk towards conflict as well. Tim Keller writes this, Turn the other cheek doesn't mean you let people walk all over you. Absolutely not. Paul didn't. He appealed to Caesar. Jesus didn't. He protested when he was struck. Hey, this is illegal, he said. 
The Bible always says you should uphold justice for the sake of justice, but you let God be the judge. You give over the ultimate judgment of that person's character to God, and you go after justice without any vengefulness in your heart. Meaning we can walk towards conflict uh, when we are the victims of injustice or when someone else is a victim of injustice or when someone else is pursuing a sinful path or when we are being lovingly rebuked. In every sense, we as Christians should be the best at conflict. We need to embrace conflict, not the conflict that leads to disunity and discord, but the conflict that leads to unity and restoration. We need to embrace conflict. Even as I'm saying this, you might be thinking, oh, that doesn't sound right because conflict is always painful. Yes, it is. Conflict is necessarily painful. But what lies on the other side of good conflict is holiness, unity, and restoration. It's a fake unity when we haven't actually gone through that crucible of conflict. It's fake holiness. It's a veneer of holiness and and unity. We need to stand up for what's right. Walk towards your sister or brother caught in sin. If it doesn't seem right, look into it. We don't need to, like, you know, shout it on social media or, or anything like that. We go to that person, again, to their face. Jesus tells in two different uh, accounts of what we do with conflict. When we are the one who has, a, who has grieved somebody else or when we are grieved by somebody else. This is what he says in Matthew 5. He says, if you're offering a gift at the altar and they remember that your brother has something against you, so you have grieved somebody else, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Then later, Matthew 18 says, if your brother sins against you, so now you are the grieved one, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And then some ways to escalate that if they don't respond with repentance. So whether you are the one who has wronged intentionally or through neglect, or if you are wronged, either way, we walk towards the conflict. Either way. And if they're a brother or a sister in Christ, they too will walk towards you. And so we both walk towards one another to engage in this good, holy conflict that leads to, again, restoration, holiness, peace, we'll see in a minute, and unity. Secondly, uh, we need to take the log out of our own eye. Now that we've walked towards conflict, one of the reasons we don't like conflict is we think well if I point out something in somebody else then that just leaves me open to uh, be under the spotlight and yeah that's absolutely right that's true and it's good we don't come we don't engage in conflict from the moral high ground we're coming as fellow sinners fellow grace receivers saying hey I Look at my life. Show me, show me where I have wronged you. If we go to someone and say, hey, I, I think I see this in your life, or <clears throat> I heard you say this, or you, you mentioned this, or whatever it is, and, that, and we don't do that for fear of them turning around and saying, well, what about you? Uh, instead, we can go to them and say, uh, hey, this is what I've noticed about you. And when they say, hey, what about you? You say, yes, please. I welcome, I welcome a loving rebuke. Because otherwise, we just have false unity. Galatians 6, Paul writes, If anyone's caught in any sin, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watching yourself, lest you too be tempted. And so he's saying, man, a goal when someone is caught in sin or when we notice something is not to go and um, spread gossip about them. Oh, do you hear what this person said? Can't believe it. It's not to try to gain some sort of social prestige by taking someone down. And our goal is, as people who are spiritual, or spiritually mature, your version might say, is to go to them and help restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Christian conflict is always humble. Christian conflict is always gentle. Christian conflict is always, always done out of love. 
we must, must. And part of this obviously is, number three, be open to rebuke yourself. Psalm 141, let a righteous man strike me. It's a kindness. Let my head not refuse. Let him rebuke me. It's oil for my head. This is what the psalmist is saying. saying, if I am in error, let someone who loves me, who is righteous, come and smack me in the face. It's like, it's like a balm on my head. Of course, that's going to hurt. I don't know if he's literally meaning, you know, smack me in the head, but he's trying to draw this parallel of when someone comes and rebukes you, especially if it's in a blind spot or if it's an unchecked idol in your life. It might come like a slap in the face. It might go, oh, I didn't even realize it. Or, or we might need to do some work. Like it might actually, either by our pride or by an unchallenged idol we have in our life, when that's exposed, we might go, well, I want to keep my idol. That might be our first instinct is to go, well, I, I like this thing. This thing makes me happy. I want to keep doing this thing. But I slap in the face, hopefully, uh, like Paul writes, when it comes with gentleness, uh, leads to restoration. Fourthly, how do, we, how do Christians do conflict? Well, we need to preach and apply the gospel to ourselves. Man, I love this passage. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 4. says, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. It's not talking about financial wealth. It says, without us, you've become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. Say, man, you have, in Christ, you have everything. Everything. If you understand who you are in Jesus, you are co-heirs with the one who whispers and galaxies appear in obedience to his voice. Do we rule with him? We share in his inheritance. Co-heirs with him. Our big brother, Jesus. When we understand who we are, how much we have in him. Paul said, you have everything. You lack nothing. And he goes on a little later, he says, also, when reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I don't know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hang on a second. <clears throat> so at the same time, we are ruling and reigning with Jesus, having everything. We become rich in Christ, and at the same time, we are scum of the earth, the refuse of all things. Paul uses some really colorful language when he's talking about the, the crap of our sin and who we are in our sinfulness. So you're thinking, how do these two things go together? How are we both ruling and reigning with Jesus, having everything, and also being scum of the earth, the refuse of all things? How do these two things go together? Well, again, he's not talking about like material riches. He's saying we are deserving of nothing. But because of the grace of God, we've been given everything. How can we take offense when we know we deserve nothing and we've been gifted everything? How will we not welcome a loving rebuke when we know it's foundational in the gospel that we are the, like Paul says, the, the scum of the earth. We're ill-deserving of anything and yet God the Father treats us as if we've done everything right like God the Son has done. He has taken upon himself our scum. He's taken upon himself our guilt. He's taken upon himself all of our shame. There's no more shame. No more guilt. No more sin on our account. And he doesn't just take us from scummy to neutral. Like he doesn't wipe the slate clean. You might have heard that. That's not true. He doesn't wipe our slate clean. He gifts to us his righteousness. So it's not like you were unable to do anything that pleases God and now you are able but you better not stuff it up because the slate's clean. No, 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 no. You've gone from absolute deficit to the riches of Christ. And so now the Father looks at you and sees a perfect, spotless, blameless daughter or son 
as if you had the righteousness of Christ because you've been gifted the righteousness of Christ. So, how could we take offense? We know we're not perfect. We're in desperate need of Christ's perfection applied to us. We should be the best at conflict. Like Don Carson says, uh, it's difficult to receive a rebuke. It's more difficult to give a rebuke. It requires us to love our sisters and our brothers. It requires us to love and pursue unity, like real unity. Not just what seems like peace, not just the absence of conflict, but even in the presence of conflict, a better peace, a true unity that comes through good conflict. It means we don't think of ourselves more highly than we are. It means we remember we too are a sinner saved by grace, just like a brother or sister is also a sinner saved by grace. It means we remember how loved we are by the perfect God in heaven. And it means when we are total, when we're reminded and live in light of the riches we have in being united, like unified, even the Bible talks about being hidden in Christ. That's how unified we are. We're hid in Christ. That when someone challenges us in our sin, uh, we don't need to get down about it. We can, be, we can live lives laid bare and open to and welcome to, even walking towards loving, rebuke, and correction because we know who we are, we know whose we are, and we have nothing to hide. When we do get offended, it means we're not, satisf- means we're not satisfied with the everything we've been given or we've forgotten how ill-deserving of it we are when we, when we take offense. It means we've forgotten how rich we are in Jesus and how ill-deserving we are of anything when we take offense. The next verse in James 4 says, Or do you suppose it is of no purpose that the Scripture says, He yearns jealously over the Spirit that He's made to dwell in us, but He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So above all, the gospel helps us to be humble. Humility is not just thinking of yourself as being really lonely. That's not what humility means. Humility means knowing where you stand. That's what humility means. Humility means zooming out and having this perspective of, well, in my own righteousness, scum of the earth, enemy of God. In Christ's righteousness, beloved son or daughter of the king. This This is what it means to be humble. And so when we go to God, we don't grovel as if we were only sinners. We don't swagger as if we were in our own righteousness perfect. We come to Him boldly and humbly. And when we come to one another, when we see the need for a loving correction or rebuke, we don't come in with a swagger. I'm awesome and you're terrible. You need to become more like me. Neither do we avoid it going, well, I'm also a sinner. What could I possibly? I can't say anything. No, no, we come with humility, knowing who we are. Sinner, loved, beloved, blameless in Christ, perfect in Christ, spotless in Christ. How many conflicts in and out of the church community would be avoided by embracing the humbling work of the gospel? When we assume the best of one another, we acknowledge that someone else is a sinner just like us. They're not this 2D cardboard cutout. The only thing I know about this person is we disagree. Or the only thing I know is the offense that I have received from them. No, no, no. They are an image bearer. They're loved by God. And they're also a sinner who's going to make mistakes. Again, foundational to the gospel. We for, if we forget to apply the gospel, that's when we take offense. But when we apply the gospel we realize, of course this person is going to let me down through neglect or even through malice. But I've been forgiven such a great debt of sin and enmity and been treated like the perfect son of God who's done everything right. And so I'm going to treat this person in the same way. The key is to live in the wonder of grace when we kind of sit in grace, when we grow in, our, in both the effect and understanding, but also the affect and the, 
the power of grace, the grace of God, this undeserved, ill-deserved favor and love and affection from the Father. It helps us to run to good conflict well, both in the receiving and in the giving, because true unity, holiness, true peace and restoration lies on the other side. What's the last thing for tonight at least? <clears throat> we need to forgive. We actually need to forgive. It's imperative that we forgive. C.S. Lewis writes, uh, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Augustine said, if you're suffering from a bad man's injustice, forgive lest there be two bad men. And Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. It's Luke 6. When we forgive, we lose our right to vengeance. We lose our right to get back at them. I'm not saying that we don't pursue justice. We do pursue justice. We already looked at this. Justice is right for justice's sake because God is a God of justice. We pursue justice. We also forgive and give up our right to vengeance. When we forgive, we have no feelings of superiority because we recognize our own need of forgiveness. When we forgive, we grieve the loss, but we don't hold it against them, and we don't hold on to the pain of the grief. doesn't mean that, gr- that pain won't be long-lasting. We don't hold on to it. When we forgive, we know that Jesus can restore all things. When we forgive, we acknowledge, we put into practice that vengeance belongs to God. We don't only, we don't only give up our longing for revenge, for revenge. We can pray for the good and seek the good of the person who's wronged us. Also, when we forgive, it doesn't mean that trust or relationship is restored. If we forgive someone who's deeply grieved us, or if someone forgives us when we've deeply grieved them, it doesn't mean that, oh, now we go back to how it was before. That might happen, but it doesn't necessarily happen. Trust is something that takes a long time to build and grow and can be smashed in, a, in an instant. doesn't mean you have to trust someone again instantly. They might not be trustworthy, but we still forgive them. doesn't mean that that person's even going to be in your life anymore necessarily. You, it might be better for you and or for them that you actually you don't cross paths in the natural anymore. But it doesn't mean you can't pray for and hope for their good. This is what forgiveness means. You don't hold it against them anymore. You can do this and at the same time still pursue justice. I think about, uh, uh, I've shared this you know, uh, thing that's going on in my family's life at the moment um, where <clears throat> my dad was riding a, a scooter, knocked off the scooter recently by a guy who, uh, by all reports, wasn't driving particularly carefully. Uh, and I was speaking to my dad just a couple of days, like two days ago saying, you know, what's the latest? What's going on with this guy? Looks like uh, he's been in this brain injury unit for a few months now and he's doing actually phenomenally well. Phenomenally well. And he's talking to me. He said, oh, I finally spoke to the police about it and looks like they're going to pursue this guy. I'm like, how do you feel about this guy? And genuinely, speaking to my dad, he has no animosity towards this bloke. Forgiven him, even though it's permanently changed my dad's life. Like, until he dies, he'll be affected by this person's either neglect or whatever. And my dad, no no malice, no ill will toward this guy, wishing, hoping, praying even for his best, and yet still wanted to pursue justice. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. They can go together. Part of the key of all of this is when we know like abundant life, like this, uh, where Paul's trying to write to this, people saying, you know, we're scum of the earth and uh, the refuse of all things, but you have everything you could possibly want in Jesus. You are rich beyond the, your wildest dreams in Christ. You rule and reign with him. That kind of life is not found in holding tightly to your rights, but in giving up your rights to become more like Jesus, who did not cling to his rights. 
Jesus rightfully would be on, lifted up on a throne. We lifted it up on a cross. Jesus would rightfully be worshipped. We scorned him. He would rightfully be the giver of life. We put him to death. Will we run to conflict like Jesus ran to us? Humbly, mind you, Jesus was the ultimate humble human because he knew exactly who he was, fully God, fully man. But he didn't consider his godness something to be clung to, but emptied himself. Uh, he, goes, he goes even further than we do. He took all of our offenses, absorbed all of our wrongs upon himself. We want to live the way Jesus did, uh, as well as have this posture of sacrifice because Jesus did for us, meaning that uh, when we are reviled, we don't return revile for reviling. We, ret we absorb wrath and return with grace. Uh, we want to not just speak the gospel, put the gospel on display with our lives. And the gospel itself is offensive. For us to say to people who don't know the gospel or don't receive the gospel with faith, or, or if we give a rebuke and that rebuke is not received well, and we say, well, remember that we are sinners, and when we're communicating the gospel, remember that you are a sinner, but you're also very loved by God. That gospel in our current, the current way that we do conflict in our world is incredibly offensive. To say, not only are you not perfect the way you are, not only should the world not bend around you, but actually you need to change, not just incrementally or iteratively, you need a wholesale heart change. In fact, you need to become a new creation that is offensive in our culture today. What we're going to do is not add any offense to the gospel by doing conflict poorly. Again, Paul writes, uh, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Peter writes, the honor is for you who believe, but for those who don't believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. But if I, brothers, as Paul again, still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. He's saying, man, the cross is offensive. The gospel is offensive. We don't want to add any offense to the gospel by bringing bad or, or poor conflict in. We don't want to bring in um, harshness. We don't want to bring in pride. We, want to, we don't want to come in on the moral high horse. We don't want to add any offense to the gospel because the gospel is already offensive enough. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul writes, we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. We want to put any obstacle in the way of the, go in, in the, way of the gospel, which means... We need to pursue conflict well. Let me finish here. Just before James gets to this part about conflict, he writes this, James 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and be false to the truth. This isn't the wisdom that comes down from above. It's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. It's like demons. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And then he goes on to say, so be really good at conflict. Not to sow discord and divisions, but because on the other side of conflict is unity, holiness, peace, and restoration. So my question for you today is, is there conflict you've been avoiding? In your family, in your neighborhood, in your sporting team, even just in yourself, with a loved one? Is there conflict you've been avoiding under the guise of promoting peace or you've been as a peace lover yeah i like peace but not a peacemaker 
peacemaker sometimes requires we go through conflict to get to peace. Otherwise, we don't have peace. We actually have a fractured relationship when we don't do the hard work of walking through conflict. Secondly, is there conflict in your life in which you need to start applying the gospel? Maybe you haven't been avoiding conflict, you have been engaging in conflict, but not well. Not in a way that honors God, more in a way that our culture around us approaches and engages conflict. Do you need to actually apply the gospel? Go to someone and say, even though I am the aggrieved party, I have engaged in conflict wrongly, and I repent, and let's walk through conflict together to get to peace. You can't control what the other person is going to do, but so long as it is up to you, like Paul writes, live peaceably with all. And most of the time, that's going to require us going through the crucible of conflict. Let's pray together. Father, again, I just want to thank you for being so good and so kind to us, so loving to us. And I just want to, on behalf of all of us here, uh, I want to repent where we as a community have not done conflict well, where we as individuals haven't done conflict well. Um, Father, I'm, 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 I'm really sorry. Help us to do it well, please, Lord. Help us to love one another enough that we are compelled to walk through and, and in conflict that leads to peace, restoration, and unity. Help us to pursue humility, please, Lord. We don't want to be people who um, avoid conflict for this fake veneer of peace. We want to be people who um, boldly, not not enjoying, not enjoying it, Lord, but boldly step into conflict. Uh, and so, Father, would you lead us by spirit? We need you. We, we actually desperately need you, Lord. Lead us by a spirit. And, Father, would you bind us together with bonds of love and peace and joy in, in every sense with the bonds of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.